Chapter 16 of Police Your Planet by Lester Del Rey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Get the Dome. To Gordon's surprise, the publicity Randolph wrote about his being security prime seemed to bring the other sections of Outer Marsport under the volunteer police control even faster but as he was too busy to worry about it, he left general coordination in the hands of Mother Corey, while Izzy and Schulberg ran the expanding of the police force. Prager arrived with the first load of food, and came storming up to him. Why didn't you tell me you were a security prime? I'm grade three myself. And I suppose that would have meant you'd have shipped in all the food we need free? Gordon asked. The other stopped to think it over. Then he laughed roughly. No, you're right. The growers would starve next year if they gave it all away now. Well, we'll get in enough food this way to keep you going for a while. A couple of weeks at least. It sounded good and might have worked if there had been normal food reserve, or if the other three quadrants had been willing to do as much. But while the immediate pressure of starvation was lifted, Gordon's own stomach told him that it wasn't an adequate diet. Signs of scurvy and pellagra were increasing. Bruce Gordon whipped himself into forgetting some of that. His army was growing, or rather his mob. There was no sense in trying to get more than the vaguest organization. It was the eighth day when he led them out in the early dawn. He had issued extra dope and managed a slight increase in the ration so they made a brave showing, until they reached the dome. There were no rifles opposed to him, as he had expected, and the guard at the gate was no heavier. But the warning had somehow been given, and both forces were ready. Stretching north from the gate were the municipals with members of some of the gangs. The other gang men were with the legals to the south, and they stood within inches of the dome, holding axes and knives. A big Mar speaker ran out from the gate, and the voice of Gannett came over it. Go back. If just one of you gets within ten feet of the dome or entrance, we're going to rip the dome. We'll destroy Marsport before we'll give in to a doped-up crowd of riffraff. You've got five minutes to get out of sight before we come out with rifles and knock you off. Now beat it. Gordon got out of the car, the kid was driving and started toward the entrance, just as the moaning wail of the crowd behind him built up. You fools, he yelled. They're bluffing. They wouldn't dare destroy the dome. Come on. But already the men were evaporating. He stared at the root, and suddenly stopped fighting the hands holding him. Beside him the kid was crying, making horrible sounds of it. He turned slowly back to the car and felt it get underway. His final sight was that of the legals and municipals, wildly scrambling for cover from each other. Mother Corey met him, dragging him back to a small room, where he dug up an impossibly precious bottle of brandy. Drink it all, Cobber. So one of your security badges had the wrong man attached to it, and word got back. Couldn't be helped. You just ran into the sacred law of Marsport, the one they teach kids. Be bad, and the dome will collapse. The dome made Marsport, and it's taboo. Gordon nodded. Maybe the old man was right. If the dome gives him a perfect cover, why let me make a jackass of myself, mother? He asked numbly. Corey shook his head setting the heavy folds of flesh to bouncing. Gave them something to live for here, Cobber, and when you get over this, you're going to announce new plans to try again. Yes, you are, but right now, you get yourself drunk. He left Gordon the bottle. After a while, the bottle was gone. He felt number, but no better, by the time Izzy came in. Trench is outside in a heavy armored car, Bruce. Says he wants to see you. Something to discuss. A proposition? 
Gordon stood up wobbling a little, trying to think. Then he swore and headed for his room. Tell him to go to hell. He saw Izzy and Sheila leave, wondering vaguely where she had been. Through the opening of the seal, he spotted them moving toward the big car outside. Then he shrugged. He finally made the stairs and reached his bed before he passed out. Sheila was standing over him when he finally woke. She dumped a headache powder into her palm and held it out, handing him a small glass of water. He swallowed the fast-acting drug and sat up, trying to remember. Then he wished he couldn't. What did Trench want? He asked thickly. He wanted to show you a badge. A security badge made out for him, she answered. At least he said he wanted to show you something, and it was about that size. He wouldn't talk with us much, but I remember his name in the book. Gordon shook his head and sat up. The book he thought, trying to focus his thoughts. The book with all the names. All right, Cuddles, he said finally. You got your meal ticket and you've outgrown it in this mess. Now I want that damned book. I've been operating in the dark. It's time I found out how to get in touch with some of those people. Where is it? She shook her head. It isn't. Bruce, I don't have it. That time I gave you the note? You didn't come when I said, and I thought you wouldn't. Then Jurgen's men broke in, and I thought they'd get it. So, so I burned it. I lied to you about using it to make you keep me. You burned it? He turned it over, staring at her. Okay, Cuddles, you burned it. You were trying to kill me then, so you burned it to keep Jurgens from getting it and putting the finger on me. Where is it, Sheila? On you? She backed away, biting her lips. No, Bruce, I burned it. I don't know why, I just did. No! She turned toward the door as he pushed up from the bed, but his arm caught her wrist, dragging her back. She whimpered once, then shrieked faintly as his hand caught the buttons on the dress, jerking them off. Then suddenly she was a writhing, biting, scratching fury. He tightened his hand and lifted her to the bed, dropping a knee onto her throat and beginning to squeeze, while he jerked the dress and thin slip off. She sat up as he released his knee. Her hoarse voice squeezed from between her writhing lips. Are you satisfied now, you mechanical beast? Do you still think I have it on me? He grinned, twisting the corners of his mouth. You don't, do you? No, a wife shouldn't keep secrets from her husband. A warm-blooded, affectionate husband to boot. He bent down, knocking aside her flailing arms, and pulled her closer to him. Better tell your husband where the book is, Cuddles. She cursed and he drew her closer. He bent down, forcing her head back and setting his lips on hers. From somewhere, wetness touched his cheek. He lifted his head and looked down. The wetness came from tears that spilled out of her eyes and ran off onto the mattress. She was making no sound, and there was no resistance, but the tears ran out one drop seeming to trip over another. All right, Sheila, he said. His voice was cracked in his ears. Another week of being a failure on this planet of failures, and I might. Go ahead and tell me I'm the same as your first husband. If I can't even keep my word to you, I can at least get out and stay out. He shook his head, waiting for her denunciation. For your amusement... I'm going to miss having you around. He stood up. Something touched his hand, and he looked down to see her fingers. Bruce, she said faintly, you meant it. You don't hate me any more. She rubbed her wrist across her eyes, and the ghost of a smile touched her lips. I don't think you're a failure, and maybe, maybe I'm not. Maybe I don't have to be a failure as a woman. A wife, Bruce. I don't want you to go. Two worlds. One huddled under its dome, forever afraid of losing that protection, 
and having to face the life the other led, and yet driven to work together or to perish together. The sacred dome. And suddenly he was shaking her. The dome. It has to be the answer. Cuddles, you broke the chain enough for me to think again. We've been blind. The whole damned planet has been blind. She blinked and then frowned. Bruce? I'm all right. I'm just half sane instead of all insane for a change. He got up, pacing the floor as he talked. Look, most of the people here are Martians. They've left Earth behind, and they're meeting this planet on its own terms, and they're adapting third-generation children. Not all, but a lot of them are breathing the air we'd die on, and they're doing fine at it. Probably second-generation ones can keep going after we'd pass out. It's just as true out here as it is on the frontier. But Marsport has that sacred dome over it. It's still trying to be Earth. And it can't do it. It's never had a chance to adjust here. And it's afraid to try. Maybe she agreed doubtfully. But what about this part of Marsport? Obvious. Here they grow up under the shadow of it. They live in a half-world and they have to live on the crumbs the dome tosses them. Sheila, if something happened to that dome... We'd be killed, she said. How do we do it? He frowned and then grinned slowly. Maybe not. They spent the rest of the night discussing it. Sometime during the discussion she made coffee, and first Randolph, then the kid came in for briefing. Randolph was a natural addition and the kid had been alternately following Gordon and Sheila around since he'd first heard they were fighting against the men who'd robbed him of his right to speak. In the end, as the night spread into day, there were more people than they felt safe with, and less than they needed. But later, as he stood beside the dome when night had fallen again, Gordon wasn't so sure. It was huge. The fabric of it was thin, and even the webbing straps that gave it added strength were frail things, but it was strong enough to hold up in the pressure of over ten pounds per square inch, and the webbing was anchored in a metal sleeve that went too high for cutting. They could rip it, but not ruin it completely, and it had to be done so that no repair could ever be made. Under it, and anchoring it, was a concrete wall all around the city, Izzy came back from a careful exploration. We can work enough powder under those webbing supports and lay the fuse wire beside the plastic ring that keeps it airtight, he reported. But God help us, Governor, if any geese spot us. They worked through the night while Rusty went back to requisition more explosives from the dwindling supply and while the kid and Izzy took time off to break into a closed converter plant and find wire enough to connect the charges. But Dawn caught them with less done than they had hoped. Gordon went to connect a wire and switch from the battery and coil they had installed, but jerked backwards as he saw a suspicious guard staring at him. Let him think we're just scouting, Randolph advised. There were suspicious looks as the group came back to the coop, but Mother Cory waddled over to meet them, did you find them, Cobber? He asked quickly, and one of his eyelids flickered. Izzy answered before Gordon could rise to it. Not yet, Mother. May have to go back tonight. Gordon left them discussing the mythical search for certain supplies that Mother Cory had apparently used as an alibi for their absence from the building. Sheila started to make coffee, but he shook his head and headed for the bed. She yawned and nodded, fingering the stitches that still ran down the blanket to divide it. Then she grimaced faintly and dropped down beside him on top of the blanket. Her head hit his arm, and she seemed to be asleep almost at once. He awoke to find Izzy shaking his shoulder. He looked down for Sheila, but she was gone. Izzy followed his eyes and shook his head. The princess took off in a car three hours ago, he said. She said it was something that had to be done, Governor, so I figured you'd know about it. Gordon shrugged and let it pass. 
He found the rest of the group ready, with Mother Cory wishing them better luck tonight. The mother obviously knew something, but he kept his suspicions to himself and gave them a cover from the others. There was no sign of Sheila near the dome, but inside there were guards pacing along it. Gordon spotted them first and drew the others back. If they'd found the carefully worked-in powder... The kid ducked down and out of the car, worming his way around the building that concealed them. He waited for the guard to vanish, then went crawling forward. Gordon swore, but there was no sense in two of them risking themselves, only to attract more attention. And at last the kid came back. He ducked into the truck, nodding. Why are an explosive still there? Gordon asked. The kid made the sound he used for a scent. It made no sense. There was no reason for the sudden vigilance inside the dome. We might be able to run the wire in, Izzy said doubtfully. Gordon grunted. And tip them off to where it is? Probably. No, we'll have to do it under some kind of covering. The way I had it planned in the first place. Only with one more damned complication. We'll pull another false raid on the dome. As soon as we get chased off, I'll manage to set it off while they're relaxing and laughing at us. It smells, as he told him. Who elected you chief martyr around here? You'll be blown up, governor. And if you ain't, they'll rip you to ribbons for knocking off the dome. Then he stopped suddenly, staring. Bruce Gordon leaned forward with Izzy's hands grabbing for him. But he'd seen it too. Standing next to the dome was Trench, talking to one of the guards, and beside him stood Sheila, with one hand resting on the man's elbow. He could feel the thickness of the silence and misery in the truck, but he pushed it away, with all the other things. Get us back, Izzy, he ordered. We've got to round up whatever group we can and get them back here on the double. They must be counting on our original time so they're in no hurry to remove the powder and wiring. But we can't count on any more time. You're going through with it? Randolph asked, doubtfully. In one hour, and you might pass the word along that we're doing it to save the dome. Tell the men we just found out that Trench is losing and intends to blow it up instead of letting the legals win. Rumor would travel fast enough, he hoped and it should give him a few extra seconds before his forces cracked. He lifted the switch in his hands and stared at it. It wasn't necessary now. All he had to do was reach the battery and drop any metal across the two terminals there. If they could get back before Trench and Sheila could remove the battery. It was a period of complete fog to him but it wasn't until his motley army reached the dome, straggling up in trucks and on foot, that he snapped into focus again. There was no sign of Sheila this time, and he didn't look for her. His whole mind was concentrated down to a single point. Get the dome. This time there was no scattering of municipals and legals. The municipal forces were rushing up toward the dome, and surprise the legals were frantically arriving in trucks. There was the beginning of a pitched battle right at the spot where Gordon needed his own cover. It made no sense to him, and he didn't care. He marched his men up, with a thin wailing of a banshee in his ears. Dome warning, Izzy shouted in his ear. Hear that siren, Govna? Means they're scared we may do it. Give me that damned switch. He grabbed for it but Gordon held firmly to the copper strap. And now the men inside caught sight of the approaching force. For a second consternation seemed to reign. Then a huge truck with a speaker on top drove into the struggling group, and the thin whisper of unintelligible words reached Gordon. The whole development made no more sense than any part of it to him. But he saw the municipals and legals suddenly begin to turn, as a single man to face the outside menace that had crept up on them while they were boiling into a fight. And suddenly the Mars speaker over the entrance blasted into life. Get back! 
The dome is mined. Any man comes near it, it'll blow. By Gordon's side, a sudden gargling sound came from the kid. His hand snaked out, caught the strap from Gordon's hand, and jerked it free. Then he was running frantically forward. Rifles lifted inside and shots rang out, clipping bullets through the dome. In one place it began to tear, and there was a sudden savage roar from the men around Gordon. He had started forward after the kid, but Izzy was in front of him, holding him back. The kid stumbled and slid across the ground, while blood spurted out from a gash across his head, and the helmet fell into pieces. Then with a jerk he was up. His hand reached out. The strap hit the terminals. And where the dome had been, a clap of thunder seemed to take visible form. The webbing straps broke, and the dome jerked upwards, twisting outwards, and then falling into ribbons. The shock wave hit Gordon, knocking him from his feet into the crowd around him. He struggled to his feet to see helmeted men pouring out of the houses around, and other men pouring forward from his own group. The few of either police force still standing and helmeted broke into a wild run, but they had no chance. The mob had decided that they had mined and exploded the dome. He turned back toward the coop. Sick with the death of the kid and the violence, for once he'd had more than his fill of it. Then a small truck drew up, and an arm went out to draw him inside the cab. He stared into the face of Isaiah Trench, and driving the truck was Sheila. Your wife took a hell of a chance, Gordon, Trench said heavily, and I took quite a chance, too, to set this up so nobody could ever believe you were behind it. Getting that fight started in time after you first showed up, oh sure, we spotted you, was the toughest job I ever did, but I guess Sheila had the roughest end, not even knowing for sure where I stood. Gordon stared at them slowly, not quite believing it, even though it was no crazier than anything else during the past few hours. Trent shrugged. I was railroaded here by security, told to be good and they'd let me go home. A lot of men got that treatment. So when Wayne was still talking about building a perfect Mars port, I joined up. He treated me right, and I took orders. But a man gets sick of working with punks and cheap hoods. He gets sicker of killing off a planet he's learned to like. I learned to take orders, though, and I took them until Wayne tried to put a bullet through me. That ended that, and I came out to join up with you. You were sauced, I hear but your wife guessed enough to take the chance of coming to me when she thought you were going to get yourself killed. Well, I guess you get out here. He indicated the coop. Gordon got down, followed by Sheila as Trench took the wheel. What happens to you now, Gordon asked. They'll be blaming you for the end of the dome. Let them. I planned on that. Too bad Trench got torn to bits by the mob, isn't it? and it's a good thing I've always kept myself a place under a safe incognito out in the sticks. Got a wife and two kids out there that even Wayne didn't know about. He stuck out a hand. You're like security, Gordon. You do all the wrong things, but you get the right results. Goodbye. Sheila watched him go, shaking her head. He likes you, Bruce, but he can't say it. Man. Women, Gordon answered. Then he stiffened. Coming down through the thin air of Mars was the bright blue exhaust of a rocket. The real security was arriving. End of chapter 16